Hello my beloved followers, the Green Scorpion here, and welcome to Patreon Month, the month where I dedicate myself to give back to my generous patrons. I love running this channel, and even when life pulls me away from videos for a while, I'm always able to work my way back to doing what I love to do, thanks to your undying support. Ladies, gentlemen, I really can't thank you enough. And in return, I'm happy to tackle your requested topics, not just out of obligation, but because it takes me to some pretty interesting places. My least favorite Fire Emblem characters, my top 10 voice actors, and top 10 dragons were all patron requests, and I'm very proud of those lists. So to kick off 2018, we'll be running some requested 5 minute reflections, plus 5 all new countdowns, starting with this submission from Eric Bergevald. <laughs> Berserkers. Angry, muscly, usually carrying an axe or a big sword. But what exactly is a Berserker? Well, for the sake of this list, I took to the internet and learned a decent bit about their history. Turns out, Berserkers were actually a real thing. The term Berserker actually comes from Norse mythology and Germanic folklore. An elite class of warrior, they charge into battle without armor, save for the pelts of bears, wolves, and boars. Legends state that the best trained could enter a state of hammerer or transformation where they would fight with rapid fury and bestial strength. In fantasy games, a berserker class is often defined with high attack power and low defenses, but that's not to say that they're glass cannons necessarily. Many games will give them high HP, so unlike your average tank, they take a lot of damage but also have the constitution to fight on anyway. Plus it gives the healer something to do. They favor ridiculous destructive potential in place of any finesse or strategy. But for this list, I want to focus on the idea of fury. I'm looking for those characters that act on or even weaponize anger itself to kill anyone in their path, whether it's with axes, guns, claws, or their bare hands. Some will be based on personality, others on physical prowess, but all of them in unadulterated rage. These qualities can be difficult to rank, so you may disagree with the order of some of these choices. Feel free to discuss your favorites in the comments, but leave the rage for the battlefield. I'm the Green Scorpion, and this is the Top 10 Video Game Berserkers! I cannot believe how close this list was to rank. I had to kill off a ton of worthy candidates to narrow down my Top 10, but one of them just refused to die. Trindamir is a great example to start with. In some ways, he's your average human barbarian, running around shirtless and swinging a two-handed sword with one hand and zero finesse. Trindamir hails from the Freljord, a northern region of Runeterra that spent centuries divided into several factions to the point where it wasn't even recognized as its own governing body. Trindamir liked anarchy as much as the next brigand, but without any rulers to represent the Freljord, city-states like Demacia were encroaching on their land, skirmishes were taking their death tolls, and looming threats like the Ice Witch drove Trinomir into action. Not only did he assert himself to lead most of the region's barbarian camps, he grew close with Ash the Frost Archer, and eventually the two got married and are now acknowledged by most of the world as King and Queen of the North. He claims it was just a political marriage, but I don't know, I still ship it. Can you ship a guy with his own wife? Politics aren't his strong suit anyway, he's a fighter. Unlike the majority of champions, Trindamir has no mana to use his abilities, nor does he use energy like Lee Sin or the ninjas. Instead, he builds fury with every swing. And with his bloodlust ability, not only can he deal more damage the more it's been dealt to him, he can also expend his fury to heal himself. That's not exactly tanky, but with bloodlust and some good lifesteal items, his offense becomes his best defense, and he really excels at ganking. He can lower someone's attack power just by yelling at them, and if they have the gall to run away while he does it, they'll be slowed. Plus, he has a spin to win that boosts him ahead, nothing too fancy. You might be thinking that Olaf should have taken this spot instead. He is actually called the Berserker and leans more into the Norse inspiration, right down to his ability called Ragnarok. But the Barbarian King clinched this with his ultimate, Undying Rage. It's exactly what it sounds like. The dude gets so angry he cannot die. All attacks and spells bouncing off of him as if they were nothing. It happens in every team fight. You think this guy is dead, and he's just not. He's your benchmark run-of-the-mill berserker, no bells and whistles. Unless you want the Demon Blade skin. I mean, it's not canon, but Riot liked it enough to use it in their short video, so I guess in a way, this is the real Trinomir too. 
Seems like a good number 10 to me. Hey Seeker, if I hit a guy high while you go low, you think we could get him to flip? Flip? Yes. Ass over tea kettle, you know. I suppose that could be done. I've always wanted to get a guy to flip. Coming in at number 9, we have the Iron Bull from Dragon Age Inquisition. First important note, it's THE Iron Bull. Three words. Second note, he's the best companion ever. I will fight you over this. With his two foot horns and rippling stony physique, the Iron Bull is a proud representative of the Canari. Like the rest of his hardy race, he has a strong devotion to his religious order, the Kuhn. But unlike his kinsmen, he loves to indulge in drinks and sex after a good day of manslaughter, to the point where he was deemed too unstable to serve as a Kanari soldier. Instead, he was assigned to the Ben Hasrith. He's a spy, something he'll happily tell you the first time you meet him. The Kanari want him to keep an eye on you and your Inquisition, and he also runs his own mercenary band, but he'll still make the time to bash some skulls alongside you. While his stats may allow you to go for a tankier build, he doesn't have a lot of armor options. I'm not sure how he put it on anyway. The way to go with him is full-on two-handed warrior. With skills like Mighty Blow, Whirlwind, and Clear a Path, the Iron Bull charges through enemy lines, but you could always do that with Cassandra if you prefer. The Iron Bull's unique skill tree, however, is the Reaver Path, which gives him more damage output for damage taken, strong moves that sacrifices HP, and ways to heal when he gets a kill, culminating in the Dragon Rage move, which he learned from studying his favorite kind of prey. But that's not why I love him. Beneath this tough exterior is a surprisingly wise and caring man. His first rage only happened because he wanted revenge on a merchant who poisoned a school full of kids, after which he lost several of his best friends while hunting the guy down. He was so distraught he lost it and took out an entire Talvashoth stronghold. He fights for what's right, but he also has a profound appreciation for the fine art of dismemberment. Tearing bad guys limb from limb, chopping them in half, feeling the bones break as he crushes their skulls. It's enough to make a man quiver. He's a beast on the battlefield, but he knows to turn it off when the fight is done. He's a good friend, a laid-back conversationalist, and if you court him, an incredibly respectful boyfriend. Just get him some big skull for his birthday, he loves them. Oh, you guys. You got me. He's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, who just happens to really love killing people. Gotta wonder about anyone who fights as much as we do and doesn't have some fun with it. We have fought living men with loves and families, and all that they might have been is gone. <laughs> yeah, but they were assholes. There are plenty of ways to go berserk without a huge sword or battle axe, but is it possible to achieve that effect in a first-person shooter? Yeah, it is. Just take a look at this game. It's called Rage. I was also thinking a lot about Brick from Borderlands, who can enter a rage state where he throws his guns down and starts punching Skags to death. Or his follow-up, Salvador the Gunzerker. While they both have an activatable rage that you can use on occasion, I want a character who exudes anger, which can be hard to do in a first-person shooter. Developers usually make these games the way they are to let the player step into the role of the character, but how do you characterize them without even being able to see them? Funny enough, one of the earliest first-person shooter games ever made had a simple solution to this. Just put the guy's face down here. This is the Nameless Marine, or as the community has come to know him, Doom Guy. We don't know much about him, but take a look at those shifty eyes, he's having a good time. If you think you're playing Doom, you're pronouncing it wrong. Check the box. It's not Doom, it's Doom. Sent to infiltrate a portal into hell established on Mars, Doom Guy decided short sleeves were the way to go. Yeah, he'll put on some power armor occasionally, but his forearms are always naked to the elements of Mars hell. Eh, they'll be fine. He wants those cyber demons to see just how strong and tough he is while he pulls the trigger with the most manly arsenal ever assembled. The super shotgun, the chainsaw, and of course, the big fucking gun 9000. There's a kind of raw intensity to Doom that later shooters have ironed out with their hoity-toity strategy. Here, the monsters are rushing you. Make them dead. 
Doom 2 keeps the same spirit alive, while Doom 3... Eh, it goes for a more survival horror angle like System Shock. Darkness, audio logs... The game's not as bad as people say, but it definitely lost sight of how the original Doom felt. That's why in 2016, we got the revival of Doom called... DOOM! which spits in the face of all modern shooter conventions. There's no cover system, just kill them before they kill you. Master Chief can only hold two guns? I'll just carry them all. Reloading? No time for that. The game rewards this kind of crazed gameplay with the glory kills that also restore Doom Guy's health, meaning you want to get up close and personal because there's no automatic health regen. You won't catch Doom Guy camping with a sniper rifle. Well, except in the crappy multiplayer mode, but that's beside the point. The best part, Doom 2016 has an actual plot. But Doom Guy doesn't give a f He was sealed in a sarcophagus by the demons for being too much of a threat to hell. When have you ever heard of demons having to seal something away? That's usually something the good guys do. But they're scared pantsless of this guy. Well, he just woke up on an operating table and he's pissed. That's enough plot for Doom Guy and enough plot for me. Man, testosterone's one hell of a drug. <laughs>you know, when you really look at it, Skullgirls is a pretty disturbing game. There's this pattern to most of the characters. Innocent girl gets either possessed or somehow wronged by another character, gets some weird power set from it, and sets out on a journey to set themselves right. I mentioned before how Squiggly had her mouth sewn shut, but hopefully it doesn't get much worse than that. Oh... Oh dear... Painwheel gives us our first example of a certain Berserker subcategory, the Beast Man. Icelandic literary accounts often describe the Berserker as fighting more like animals than human beings. Following this line, several Beast Lords ignore their human civility and revert to pure instinct. You can see this in characters that were raised in the wild or werewolves, but it's best to think of Painwheel as a female Wolverine. Well, that's Laura Kinney, she's already a thing. But now that I think about it, Painwheel's probably more like Laura Kinney than the original Wolverine. Because at least Logan volunteered for the Weapon X program. Carol was a normal girl living a normal life when she was abducted by anti-Skullgirl labs. They infused her with tainted Skullgirl blood so that she could track down and defeat Bloody Mary. And they also mentally broke her so that she could be controlled by the villainous brain drain, messed up her face, and outfitted her with some Wolverine claws, but not just in her hands. She's also got spikes on her elbows, her knees, her shoulders, really anywhere she's willing to pull them from. There's no limit because she barely cares about pain anymore. In battle, she twists and contorts her body into all kinds of agonizing shapes. She can't possibly hurt any more than she already does. She gets super armor on many of her attacks because she just doesn't care anymore. And, as I'm sure you've noticed, Valentine added a big pinwheel blade fused right onto her spinal cord. The matter she gets, the faster the wheel spins. She can even fly with it. And she can activate her hatred install to get faster and stronger, running on pure fury. It was part of ASG's design for her to be angry, but they might have gone a little overboard to the point where Carol is able to override all of Brain Drain's mental conditioning and cut Valentine to ribbons. It might also have to do with her getting closer to the Skull Heart, but to me though, the interesting part is the source of this fury. The sheer potential for boundless, unending anger. Where does this come from? I mean, I know why she's mad, but who knew it was possible to even be that angry? It's not like being bitten by a werewolf or having lupine genes mixed into your own. This ability to outrage, to hate, it was already there to begin with. There's just no love cushioning it anymore. They took this sweet girl who loved dogs and beaches and gardening and ripped everything away piece by piece, leaving only the anguish that she is now. And judging by her ending, she won't be returning to a normal life anytime soon. Because how do you go home after turning into this? Being a monster is all she knows how to do anymore. I think the rule I established with Spyro worked really well in Top 10 Dragons. Basically, if I have a character that meets the criteria, but is just so different from the other choices that I can't decide where to put them, they get an honorary spot in the middle. Which is the case I get here with someone who isn't a physical juggernaut, but can only be described as Berserk. This is Trevor Phillips. 
Trevor is one of three playable characters in Grand Theft Auto V, a Canadian-born criminal who hit rock bottom and just kept going down. One way to look at our protagonists is as foils. Michael is at a crossroads to continue his life of crime or try for an honest life. Franklin is relatively new to big crime like Michael once was, and Trevor is a cautionary tale of what Michael could become. Or for you psych majors out there, Michael and Franklin represent the ego and super ego, while Trevor is all id. He wants something, he takes it. He gets mad, he breaks it. He's a sex addict, a drug addict, he's prone to violent outbursts, and he just doesn't know what to do about it. Take our first introduction to him. He's selling meth to a guy named Johnny and decides he really likes Johnny's wife. And so, he takes his wife. Johnny calls him out on it, the two yell at each other, but finally Trevor calms him down and they hug it out. Before Trevor throws him down to the ground mid-hug and stomps him to death. The problem is, Johnny is the leader of a dangerous gang who will want revenge, so I guess Trevor will just have to go and kill them all too. This is how he lives his dumpster fire of a life, taking drastic steps to get the things he wants, and killing people to fix the problem he made by being so drastic. He's not a combat berserker the same way these other characters are, but Trevor is a realistic figure who lives in a berserker state. Then again, I guess there is a case to be made that he is a combat berserker. I mean, of course you can hurt people in this game, it's GTA. But unique to Trevor is his red mist ability, which allows him to take less damage and deal more damage for a time. Yeah, you can cast Rage in GTA. This is especially helpful for Trevor's exclusive side missions, the Rampages. In these segments, Trevor has to simply kill as many people as he can in a given time limit. But the scary part is that these missions usually start just because someone rubs Trevor the wrong way. It can be as petty as pointing out Trevor's Canadian accent, or insulting Trevor's mother. Guys, don't ever talk to Trevor about his mom. That's a road you do not want to go down. Here's some other best ofs. As a kid, he got kicked off of his hockey team, so he violated his coach with a hockey stick. He probably killed his brother, and his father eventually gave up on him and abandoned him in a shopping mall, so he proceeded to burn the whole mall down. He wanted a lackey, so he met up with a guy named Wade, killed his friends in a quarry, and told Wade that they ditched him so that he'd stick around. And that's all just background! He also obsesses over an athlete woman and bike races to impress her. He tortures a guy to get information and drives him to the airport just to thank him for all the fun he just had. He was deemed psychologically unfit to remain in the Air Force, but he steals planes for recreation. And the most positive relationship we ever see from him is with a mob leader's wife that he kidnapped. Grand Theft Auto is meant to simulate bringing anarchy to a society that thinks everything is in order. As a man that society just couldn't make room for, Trevor is out to prove that the world is as mad, mad, mad as he is. You listen to him long enough, you'll start to feel it too. Shit, I don't know how much more better that is than Devin's con. Ooh, hypocrisy, Franklin. Civilization's greatest virtue. Jesus, your therapist has a lot to answer for. I know, I still hate myself. But hey, at least I know the words for it now. Yeah, but I hate you and I know the words for it, so does that mean I don't have to go to therapy? Look, man. You two motherfuckers terrify me of that middle age. I'm good. You're right to be afraid, Franklin. Yeah. Be very afraid, Franklin. Well, that was weird. Now I feel off kilter. I need to get back to the roots of this trope and get a more basic example. Classic axe-wielding types. When I think of berserkers, the most prototypical place I can think of is good old Dungeons and Dragons. I got into D&D when it was in 3.5, which featured the Barbarian class. It's everything you'd want it to be. It has higher hit die than the other classes, gets very few skills as a trade-off, and has the trademark rage ability. D&D has had a monumental impact on the video game landscape, so I figured I could find this kind of played straight barbarian somewhere. Dragon Age has Ogryn, and of course the Iron Bull, Baldur's Gate has Minsk, and Darkest Dungeon has the Hellion. But when it comes to simple portrayals of tabletop barbarians, my favorite rendition has to be the Barbarian class from Diablo. Blizzard must have liked this class too, because they featured it in all three generations of the game. At least they tried to. Diablo 1 only had three classes with the Hellfire expansion adding a fourth, but there's an unfinished Barbarian class hidden in the game's code that would have been a more min-maxed warrior. 
Barbarians got their first real appearance in Diablo 2, and were so popular that they came back for Diablo 3, which is the one I played the most of. Not my favorite class in the game, but easily my favorite Barbarian class from any game. You may recognize this guy from my top 10 axe wielders, and I stand by that, though he's good with pretty much any weapon he can swing around. And their lore is much richer than a bunch of blubbery brigands might lead you to believe. Like in real world history, where the term barbarian was only created by groups like the Holy Roman Empire to denounce societies that didn't speak their language, the so-called barbarians of Mount Erit were originally known as the children of Bolkathos. In ancient times, they were appointed to protect the all-powerful World Stone, and generations of mountain dwelling hardened them into mighty sentinels. Their test started when the demon Baal came for the World Stone, and while the children's defense was formidable, the angel Tyrell decided that the risk of Baal's victory was too great, and shattered both the World Stone and Mount Erit, leaving the barbarians forlorn without a home or purpose. They scattered, some becoming criminals and cutthroats, but one barbarian, THE Barbarian, found his way to the plot of Diablo 3 and decided to strive for a new victory that could reunite his people and pride. With a variety of melee skills, stuns, knockbacks, and multi-target cleaves, the Barbarian is your go-to frontline fighter. And like Trindamir, he works on a fury mechanic, building it as he takes and deals damage and losing it any other time. The strategy for playing Barbarian is to get angry and stay angry. You should never not be surrounded by demons. The more you fight, the more you can fight. So yeah, the rage is there. What sets this demon demolitionist apart though, is that flavor. Look at some of the art here. The gray hair shows the barbarian is an elder, but his muscles show that he's endured through constant physical conditioning. And sure, it may seem like he's just being angry, but there's a mental and even spiritual component to this. The Diablo Barbarian is almost monk-like. Much like how Norse Berserkers observed a religion that informed their battle prowess, the children of Bolkathos treated managing this anger as a discipline. And that gets back to my favorite aspect about Dungeons and Dragons. Barbarians aren't supposed to be stupid. You probably dumped intelligence when you made one, but they also encourage high wisdom and come with impressive will saves. They might not be good at basic math, but their minds are strong enough to endure magical illusions and resist fear or corruption. And I feel like Diablo gets that. I know it's a little weird putting a whole class on this list, but the canon usually creates a name for most of these characters so they can put them in Heroes of the Storm. Let's check. His name is... Sonya. Hi, Sonya. Eh, now that I think about it, in Diablo you could make just about any class as male or female. So, okay, yeah. This spot goes to Sonya as a representative of the Diablo trilogy. Earthquaking the ground, rage grappling into foes, shaking off stuns, and wielding a giant claymore in each hand. I'm okay with this. Thanks, Sonya. You do your class proud. I play a lot of fighting games, and when I do, I prefer the rushdown characters. Berserkers work really well for that, like Saberwolf and Killer Instinct, or as I mentioned before, Pain Wheel. But Street Fighter's never really done that, has it? The closest we got to a Saber Wolf was, I don't know, Blanca? For the first four generations of Street Fighter, someone like that would have been against the game's design philosophy. Street Fighter is a slower, more methodical game. Even when it went turbo, this game was always pretty footsie, with an emphasis on perfect positioning to get those chained hits. Even the story denounces giving into anger. Take Ryu and his struggle to maintain the Satsui no Hado, for example. Meanwhile, Akuma, who embraced that malevolent energy, decided this game was too passive and went to go be in Tekken instead. But before his return as an awesome DLC character, we got a new challenger in Street Fighter V who broke the mold with animalistic malice, Nikali. I hope my little introduction there explains just how out of place Nikali felt when he was first introduced. And his backstory, what little we know of it, is just jarring. Apparently he's some type of ancient force that's been dormant beneath the loam of South America. His design is based heavily on Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec god of war, and the sun, and human sacrifice. He did a lot. Nikali exists only to fight the greatest warriors he can find, devour their essence, and tribute their souls, supposedly, to his Aztec god. At least I think that's what's happening here. It's honestly a little unclear. He's not exactly talkative. When he wins, he holds up his victim by the head as if offering them to the heavens. So that's war, sun, and human sacrifice right there. Everything checks out. I don't get why he travels by melting into clay, but alright. I guess he's also a geomancer. 
You'd think he'd be a big deal in the much-touted story mode of SF5, but he really only shows up from time to time because Bison's plot woke him up early. They do use him to foil that Ryu inner turmoil that I was talking about earlier, so that's cool at least. And it's a nice change of pace seeing such unrestricted savagery in this series. The SF5 roster may have started a little light in quantity, but you can tell a lot of thought and specificity went into the movesets. And here, it's all about being brutal. He doesn't punch people, he swats at them like a starving puma. He throws people just close enough to dash and hit them again. Road of the Sun lets him alter his jump arc so that he's harder to anti-air. He gets projectile armor from the disc's guidance. Even the little things like how his standing medium kick moves him just a little bit forward so that you can keep the pressure on. There's a lot of subtle refinement to this, and never mind, he just went Super Saiyan. Of course they had to put a rage mode in Street Fighter. Way to go, Capcom. Points to you. Yay. Woo. Ugh. This is going to disappoint a lot of you. There's no Fire Emblem character on this list. I, I know. I can't believe it either. I had so many great choices that the Berserker units got pushed out. In case you're wondering, my choice would have been Legion. Even though I never played Mystery of the Emblem, he is available in Fire Emblem Heroes, and I love him there, so it's good enough to get me researching. The number 3 spot is a similar case. I know a lot of people were expecting Velvet Crow from Tales of Berseria on this list. I mean, it's Tales of Berseria, the root word being Berserk. She's the titular Berserker, and an excellent choice, but another Tales contender stole my heart. I've never played Tales of Destiny, but I've seen this cameo in Vesperia... So, oh my god, here he is. Barbados Goatia. Barbados hits on all the obvious notes as soon as you see him. He's big, his axe is big, and his penchant for anger is enormous. But he's also an interesting comment on the Berserker trope, both in how he embodies and betrays the fundamentals of Norse heroism. Barbados just wants to be remembered. He wants to go down in history as the guy who fought bravely and saved the day. That was the whole Berserker ideal. The ones who die in battle go to Valhalla and are celebrated for their bravery. But while in battle he fights with the heart of a lion and the brain of a Tyrannosaurus, his actions outside of battle are underhanded and downright cowardly. Hundreds of years before Tales of Destiny 2, Barbados fought in the Aether Wars for the sole purpose of fame. But he saw his country was losing, and that's not good for his track record, so he flipped sides and betrayed his homeland. And he really did try to die a warrior's death. He was dueling with a lieutenant when Major General Menard interrupted the battle, and Barbados was so pissed he rampaged after Menard and was tricked into running off a cliff. If there were a Valhalla for Darwin Award winners, he'd be set. But instead, he was struck from history for being a Benedict to Arnold. Except, people remember who Benedict to Arnold was. Barbados was forgotten. Jump ahead in time, and a nefarious priestess named Elraine is trying to alter history, and resurrects Barbados to be her personal muscle, offering him a second chance at heroism. Which would be great if Barbados had any concept of what heroism was. It's almost tragic. The guy finds the one-on-one -on -one battle to be sacred, but will resort to the most underhanded tactics outside of a duel, from kidnapping a target's kids to killing an unarmed enemy. He also develops a deep grudge with the game's protagonist, Kyle, after his first defeat. He's so petty, this actually sidelines from Elraine's original mission, and when Elraine tries to mind control him into doing what he was hired to do, he uses his barbarian rage, at great personal pain, and actually resists it, then tries to prove his superiority over Kyle by going back in time and killing his parents before he can be conceived. Yeah, that'll make you the bigger man, Barbados. Killing a kid so young, he literally doesn't exist yet. When on his last legs, he plunges into the eye of Atamoni, just so he can die before anyone can kill him. It's just... He really, really wants to be a Norse Berserker, but he just doesn't know how. That's more than enough background, but it's far from the reason why he's here. Let's talk about boss fights. In the original Tales of Destiny 2, Barbados is absurdly strong, but also has some magic spells, as most Tales characters do. All later appearances of the character would be changed to make him a purely physical threat, though he can still magically pull rocks out of the ground and smash them like Persea. And again, we see his famous hypocrisy. Even in this version where Barbados uses magic, he gets pissed if any of your characters do, and counters every spell your party casts with another spell. 
They brought him back in the PS2 remake of Tales of Destiny 1 as the boss of the post-game dungeon, and he's traded his spells for the number zero greatest mystic art, no items ever. That's seriously what it's called, because that's what he yells. Unlike other mystics, Barbados doesn't have to be an over limit and there's no cooldown. He just uses it any time you use an item. You even think about popping that apple gel and he'll stomp you into human gel. Now you could try to hide from him while your healer gets you back up, but he has a plan for that too. If you haven't attacked him in a few seconds, he'll start channeling his anger through his ace into the ground to activate World Destroyer, a basically unavoidable total party knockout. Oh, and do not try to face him on simple mode, where he gains the cheap eliminate move that instantly kills all filthy casuals. It's one thing for Cuphead to lock you out of the final boss for playing on easy difficulty, but Barbados lets you fight him and insta-kills you just to rub it in your face. Then again, you don't have to wait until the post game to see Barbados. At any point in the game, just switch all of your characters to auto for some easy no input leveling, and eventually Barbados will show up and lecture you for taking the easy way out. Oh, did I say lecture? I meant to say kill! He shows up and kills your party for cheap auto leveling! Is this guy for real? This is coming from the guy who uses cheap tactics out of combat, but once the battle starts, he's fighting you head on, and he insists you do the same! Norse, 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 I've been talking a lot about Norse today. But let's not pretend that Norway has a monopoly on Berserker Legend. I mean, we already talked a bit about the Aztecs, and keep in mind that one of our most influential stories of a man going into a violent rage comes from Greek mythology, the story of Hercules. Or Heracles, if you want to be that guy. In myth, Zeus's wife Hera hated Hercules for being Zeus's illegitimate son, and struck him with a blood-curdling rage that drove him to slay his wife and children against his own will. This forced a heartbroken Hercules to perform the 12 labors to cleanse his soul, which never really made a lot of sense to me since it's not like it was his fault, why should he have to redeem himself? Well anyway, it turns out that the greatest rage story of Western culture happened a few times in Greece, most notably to a certain cue ball named Kratos. Even before the big inciting incident with his family, Kratos was pretty unhinged. His childhood involved a difficult relationship with his mom and his brother, and he made his living as a soldier of Sparta, one of the most bloodthirsty cities in human history. But specifically, Kratos was a champion of Ares, the Greek god of war, and during a battle for Greece against the barbarian king, Kratos was able to invoke his god and was gifted with the sacred blades of chaos, big swords on chains that come right out of his veins. I think it's safe to say Kratos literally bleeds violence. But Kratos got a little too mellow after he settled down with a wife and daughter, so Ares put a berserker hex on him to make him kill the family holding him back from more military greatness. Now, unlike Hercules, who spends the rest of his life trying to honor the gods as a hero and make up for his involuntary manslaughter, Kratos sets out for the most coveted of classical compensation. Revenge. He slays a bunch of Greek beasts, takes down Ares with one of the greatest zingers in video games. I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. And becomes the new god of war. That's enough merit already. He's already obscenely strong and comfortable with weapons and bare hands. And he may look more like Quan Chi than an actual Spartan, but to quote the god of war director David Jaff, Kratos may not totally feel at home in ancient Greece from a costume standpoint. I think he achieves the greater purpose which is to give players a character who really does just let them go nuts and unleash the nasty fantasies that they have in their head. But the fun doesn't stop with Ares. When Zeus betrays Kratos, fearing his power has gotten too strong, Kratos turns his sights on the entire pantheon of Olympus. Never mind that these guys govern the elements and killing them might have serious repercussions on the planet. If it's not vengeance, Kratos isn't interested. And it is brutal! Main combat in God of War consists of wildly swinging the chain blades, but finishers shift into extended quick time events that show just how sadistic Kratos can be. Sure, Doom Guy has some gruesome fatalities, but Kratos makes it personal. Cutting off Hermes' legs so he can squirm before he dies, gouging out Poseidon's eyes, smashing Theseus' skull with the door he was trying to guard, and Prometheus! I mean, he was already hanging. He probably would have asphyxiated, but Kratos chooses to shoot him down so he can burn in his own 
fire! Holy Hera, man! True, Kratos is in a lot of pain, but that hardly justifies just how far he's gone to satiate his bloodlust. On multiple occasions, when given the choice between saving the world and punching Zeus, he chooses to punch Zeus. And he comes really close to ending all life as we know it. Ares did him wrong, but while Kratos' first murderous blitzkrieg was the result of divine intervention, he uses that to justify all of his savagery. All of the gods and pretty much everyone in Greece, dead. Except for Aphrodite, because... Well... And hey, it looks like in the new series he'll be trying to finally leave all of that in the past and do right by his new son. With no more Olympians to regicide, this story will be concerning... Norse mythology! Well, maybe in a year we can compare Kratos to the original Berserkers. Ragnarok's coming early this year! Maybe we'll get to see Kratos trade blows with Thor or Odin or Baldur or whatever, but if he wants to see rage at its purest form, he'll have to head to the sci-fi Buddhist Hindu inspired world of Gaia and contend with Asura's wrath. You mad, bro? Because this was never even a contest. Ashura had this list locked down from day one. There are some strong parallels between Ashura and Kratos. Both are demigods, both love them so quick time events, and both are motivated by revenge. In Ashura's case, he used to be a member of the Eight Guardian Generals, a group of Gaia's deities who protected the world. But when he declined involvement in another demigod's plan for greater power, he was framed for murder, his wife was killed, his daughter Mithra was kidnapped, and he was thrown into Naraka, which is basically Buddhist hell. Asura reincarnated 12,000 years later, and though his memories take some time to recalibrate at first, the millennia has done nothing to erode his grudge. One interesting difference is that Asura has the chance to rescue his daughter while Kratos already has nothing to lose. But as Asura says, being angry is just about the only thing he's good at. He's a seasoned warrior, but parenting Mithra is always difficult for him, since all he really knows to do is punch things that make her cry. This human element of the character is actually addressed. But the other main difference is how rage works in this universe. Kratos is in line with Trevor or Doomguy, where chronic anger drives them but has no tangible power outside of characterization. With characters like Sasha and Trinomir and indeed Ashura, rage is an actual resource, but not just as a game mechanic, but as a source of actual power. Each of the deities has a mantra affinity from which they draw power from, such as melancholy, lust, or vanity. Ashura's affinity is wrath. And it turns out that this is the best one, because while other gods supplement their power reserves with the praise of the people, or just harvest thousands of human souls and convert them into mantra, Astra systematically destroys them single-handedly. Wait, did I say single-handedly because he has a variable amount of arms? But I'll get to that. Astra detests the use of innocent humans and doesn't even like being worshipped himself. Even a thank you from the people he just saved makes him uneasy. So when he parries a blow from Wizen, who's the size of Jupiter, mind you, that's all Berserker energy. Most of the deities have a transformed state they activate when they have to do battle, but not only is Astra in his battle form about 90% of the time, he keeps reaching new, more ridiculous forms just because he has so many feelings. As Vajra Astra, he is ultra strong and can throw energy punches like an AK-47. Get him a little madder, and he'll form four more energy constructed arms for even more mad punching. Then there's Berserk Asura, notably the only one where he actually has zero control over his choices. Like the Incredible Hulk, his power, proportional to his rage, is theoretically infinite, though it does do damage to his body over time. His Berserk mode eventually peters out into Wrath Asura, where he's now hurting himself more with each punch than his enemies, but that's never an excuse for him to stop. Other times, the backfire will cause him to lose arms, but he'll still Monty Python his way to victory. He reaches his ultimate form when Mithra grants him the moral support to become Mantra Asura. But then, that isn't even his true form. 
because he gets the mantra reactor installed into his body that lets him actually regulate the power without spontaneously combusting. And then he still has another form called Ashura the Destructor, which you'd think would be the ultimate annihilation. And yeah, he can now punch planets and stars into smithereens, but he first uses it to block a blast and protect the planet. He attack, but he also protect. This is why I like Asura more than Kratos, besides the obvious change in scale. I mean, this is basically anime the game. Kratos and Asura's stories even have similar endings. The hero brings an end to the gods and leaves hope for mankind to govern themselves. But where in God of War, Kratos kind of decides at the last minute to help humanity now that he's screwed up the planet. But Asura always disliked the superiority of the gods, and always wanted what was best for the people. Where Kratos sacrifices Pandora, who's become a surrogate daughter to him, just so he can finish Zeus, Asura kills Chakravartin at the expense of himself, in spite of his daughter's protests, to save her and everyone else. Kratos was willing to go through everyone and anyone to kill Ares and Zeus and to hell with the consequences, but Asura targets his anger more carefully, specifically ensuring that no innocents are ever caught in the crossfire, and hating the deities all the more for not having that same level of compassion. Think back to those Nordic Berserkers. They used anger to fight, yes, but they had something to fight for. Their country, their kin, their people. There's the stigma that anger is inherently a bad thing. But while it's not necessarily as fun being angry as being happy, anger is a very important emotion. It's capable of incredible good when properly channeled, and it helps us recognize injustice or spurs us to positive action. Look at these berserkers and why they fight. Trindamir took up fighting to protect the Freljord. The Iron Bull fights for the Canari. Sonya fights for the Bull Kathos, Nikali for his god. Even Trevor, though not taking steps to really fix anything, is the way he is because of the cruelty of modern society and how it leaves people like him behind, and similarly, Kratos because of the gods and how they play with the lives of mortals. This can go horribly wrong if the fighter's goals are more selfish, as with Barbados. And I'm not saying that these characters need to be good to be compelling, of course Kratos hurts people, it's a Greek tragedy. But despite Asura's only talent being his bottomless wrath, not once does he use it as an excuse to hurt the undeserving or to take for his own gain. There's no use for gods that only take, says Asura. And though he won't accept thanks for it, Asura ultimately uses his destructive powers to save people. He found what he was truly angry about, and he used his anger to fix it. I am the Green Scorpion, and thank you, Eric Bergevald, for such an engaging topic and for reminding me of a very important lesson. When faced with the evils of this world, happiness can give you the foundation to bear it. Sadness gives you the wisdom to acknowledge it, and anger gives you the strength to oppose it. So rise, my friends, and be angry!